Hey guys, Pastor Ben here with another review and reflection. Today I want to talk about The Modern Cottage Garden, a fresh approach to a classic style by Greg Lodes. Uh, photographs are here by Neil Hepworth. Uh, this is a book that um, I picked up again from our local library as um, continuing to learn more about landscape design and horticulture and things like that. Um, cottage gardens are of course something that a lot of uh, us uh, are drawn to um, and uh, as we're thinking about what that might look like on our property I picked up this book thinking it might have something uh, of interest to share. Um, I am not someone who by personality is drawn to the word modern that's always sort of like raises a red flag in my mind but uh, in terms of garden design uh, it's been interesting to see kind of the thesis of this book so let me explain kind of what's driving this book and what it contributes what I think it does well and then where I felt like it was maybe a little bit lacking. Um, so first off, this book is taking the idea that um, a lot of us obviously love traditional cottage gardens. When you think about a, a cottage garden, you often think about you know these kind of English gardens that are just beautifully abundant, you know, with flowers. And there's kind of classic flowers you expect to see, things like roses, you know, and um, delphiniums and hollyhocks and these kind of big, bloomy, abundant. Uh, um, plantings, you know, very densely planted and um, often, you know, really kind of hitting their peak there in early summer with just all these wonderful colors, a lot of pastel kind of colors and things. And so it's a very kind of traditional feel. And um, Greg Lodes, uh, the author of this book, begins by kind of walking us through what was the history of that design? Where did that come from? What made it so popular? And he talks about how originally cottage gardens were... Um, gardens that ordinary people would have outside of their home and it was often a kind of free-flowing mix of beautiful flowering plants as well as a lot of vegetables and herbs and things like that as well i mean it was the the kind of garden of a, of a cottager and um it wasn't until the victorian era kind of the end of the 1800s uh, beginning of the 1900s that what we think of as the cottage garden style really came into vogue and that was largely when uh, more aristocratic planters picked up on that idea of just this kind of dense, loose, organic, free-flowing, um, packed garden became very popular. They tended to move it away from more productive mixed spaces toward a more kind of traditionally or, you know, strictly um, flower-oriented um, design. But that has become very common. You'll see it at a lot of the great houses in England and things like that. And so it's something that is much beloved. Well, what um, Greg Lodes is arguing is that that traditional style um, is actually something that can mix quite well with some of the more recent trends in gardening and landscape design. So again, for those who are interested in these types of things or who have been gardening for a number of years, you'll know that um, there have been a number of big changes in terms of gardening uh, in the last you know, 30 or 40 years. And um, one of the big you know, factors has been the perennial movement. So you know, plants that aren't just planted for one season and then have to be replanted, uh, but rather plants that you um, plant and have abiding interest. And one of the things that has also become a big emphasis is how do you get um, interest in your plants throughout the seasons? So that looks like trying to have uh, flowers and shrubs and plants and things that are gonna be blooming maybe for longer. Um, a lot of the plants that we love and some plants that are tr kind of traditional cottage garden plants are beautiful, but they may only bloom for a month or a couple weeks or maybe even a few days. Um, again, if you are uh, living on a country estate and you're only spending June, you know, at your at that estate, then it's okay to have everything showing off gloriously at June and then kind of be petering off the rest of the time. But for those of us who just live in one place and this is our garden, this is our house, you want to have something always kind of in bloom throughout the season. And then again, thinking about how not only the blooms of plants, but the structure of plants can add interest into the fall and even through the winter. A lot of us are learning that you don't have to cut everything back in September or October. You can leave it and wait until January or February to cut things back and you get that architectural interest, you know, in just the shape of the plants. And it can look really cool if you live in a, a place where you get frost or snow to have that resting on, you know, your sedum or whatever it might be. So um, that's been a big movement. And so what, what, Lodes is arguing is that actually the cottage garden lends itself well 
to incorporating some of those newer plants, not only perennials in terms of shrubs and things, but especially grasses. That's become grasses have become very popular. Um, I'm from Kansas, so I'm I'm a big fan of that. Something you know, I I grew up uh, in Florida, so we had a lot of grasses on the beach, and then I spent my, the rest of my time in Kansas, so the prairies. So I, I've always been a big fan of the of the big ornamental grasses and things, and so it's neat to see that taking the place. And so he's basically arguing that you can you can take a garden cottage garden approach, you know, which is kind of a more formal layout of your beds, but then a very dense, organically packed um, bed. Um, and, and you can incorporate some of these perennial plants, uh, grasses and things like that, and actually get some really striking combinations and extend, you know, the, the appeal of your cottage garden through the summer into the fall, all of that. So that's kind of, in a sense, the thesis of the book. Uh, he has the, the kind of four sections uh, in, in this book of what he's doing. Uh, first, the roots. So he kind of walks through some of the history that I just shared. What was what is a traditional cottage garden? What are the, the features of it? And then what he calls the new perennial garden. What have been the changes in the last several years? And then he tries to pull that together in the second section of how can you combine these things to make a modern cottage, cottage garden is his turn. So he talks about some different ideas for doing that, ways of doing it in smaller spaces, and spends actually quite a bit of time talking about planting in containers. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then this is a really interesting feature of the book. I like it when gardening books do this, especially as someone who's more on the beginner side. He just goes through a year in the modern cottage garden. And so spring, summer, autumn, and winter, he goes through each of those seasons, talks about what you can expect to see, some of the features, some of the joys of that season, but also kind of some chores and things. Here are the things you should be expecting to do in your cottage garden. Again, the specific chore list is going to come down a lot to which plants you pick and also where you live. Um, I'll talk about that again in a moment, but uh, it is helpful to kind of have at a general level, okay, what are the kinds of things you're going to be doing in the spring versus in the fall and so on and so forth. And then the last section, the fourth section, he just has 50 essential plants, A to Z, and he has these um, profiles, you know, where he'll give you, you know, a picture and then description, plant type, soil type, sun, height spacing, season of interest, those kinds of things. So a great place to kind of look and get some ideas of the kinds of things and combinations that he has uh, in mind when he talks about the um, modern cottage garden. So that's what this book is doing. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? Um, I think the strengths are, I like the basic idea. Actually, as we've talked about a cottage garden, we were very much drawn to that. But then when we were putting together our plant list and then looking at the plant lists of real like traditional cottage gardens, we realized there was a bit of a disconnect there. We were drawn much more towards perennials and things. Um, and uh, so a part of me had this crisis of like, okay, does that mean we're not doing a cottage garden or we're doing something else? Reading this book helped me to see you, you can take elements of a cottage garden and do some different things with it and it can still be a cottage garden and still have that same effect even though you're doing different things and can actually extend the interest of it. So that was reassuring for me and uh, I found that interesting and, and helpful. He has quite a few photographs in this book, uh, very beautiful. I really like the way the book is laid out, the structure of it. I like the fact that he spends some time getting into a bit of the history and theory of the different approaches. That appeals just to me. Um, again, I've already said, I like the, the kind of going through the year and then having the list of plants at the back. All of that is useful. So all in all, I enjoyed it. I'm glad I read the book. I thought it was good. Having said that, there are some uh, limitations or downsides to this book. Some things that I noticed, some things that other people picked up in their reviews. So one thing to mention is this is put out by uh, Timber Press, which is an American publisher. But Greg Lodes is British, and this is a very British-focused book. I don't mind that, but they didn't. there's some things they don't translate. So one of the really important things is he talks about all sorts of different plants, and he even goes through those 50 plants in the back, and there's no mention of growing zones. You don't know which zone this plant will actually be hardy in, which is a big limitation. You've got to go look up each of these items then and say, okay, can I even grow this here? Um, and I don't know why they didn't add that in. I mean, I know that in Britain they've got their own growing zones and that's fine, but he's not even using those. He just doesn't talk about growing zones at all, as far as I can remember, except I think once he mentions that kind of where he is is close to um, our growing zone six, which is actually what I'm in. So that's that works out. But for everybody else, it's like that's that's a big limitation. So 
Anyways, he doesn't mention growing zones. I don't know why that's why that's the case. Um, the second thing is, I felt like this book started really strong um, in terms of laying out this basic idea. I felt like the end, where he's kind of going through the seasons and the plant list, that was all really strong. But when he starts to talk about like actually making a modern cottage garden and kind of the execution, uh, ironically, I felt like that was where he felt faltered a little bit, which is what you would expect to be the strongest part of this book. And the reason I felt like it faltered was because the examples he gave um, were, well, so, so first off, I felt like he didn't have a lot of examples of a modern cottage garden. He had a lot of examples of cottage gardens and a lot of examples of perennial gardens, you know, kind of the new perennial movement, um, but not a lot of like tangible examples of what it would look like to blend the two of them together. And a lot of the examples he gives of both the traditional cottage garden and the new perennial garden are like arboretums and botanical gardens and big national gardens where you've got, you know, professional botanists and horticulturalists and volunteers and all of this. And so again, for the person trying to think about doing this in their own yard or their own garden, it didn't give as much direction as I would have liked. Um, where he does get most tangible is when he walks you through his garden, which is really interesting. However, it has almost the opposite problem. Instead of being this big, sprawling thing, he lives in um, Hull, I think, which is on the east coast of England. And he got a small house with, basically, he doesn't have a yard. He has like a back patio. So he's done everything in like a few raised beds and containers, which is very interesting to see what could you do with that from a design perspective. Here's a professional gardener writing gardening books, and he's got this tiny little yard, but he still made something beautiful. So that's interesting. However, it's like the examples you get are either big, you know, um, gardens that people go pay to visit or a patio garden. And I would have liked to seen some things in between. So that that felt like a little bit of a weakness that you're still kind of left wondering what exactly does this look like and how exactly do I make it work? Um, having said that, I think it is worth looking at. Um, and it was a fun read, beautiful pictures, well laid out. He's a good writer. Um, and, um, uh, so in terms of infra information and inspiration, which is always what I'm looking for with these kinds of books, I think it, it scores, uh, you know, three stars, four stars, something like that on both of those. So not a perfect book, but worth looking at. The Modern Cottage Garden by Greg Lodes.